praying in the spirit with vision. Praying in the spirit with vision. Okay? And this is what I want to talk to you about tonight. And it's a powerful, real powerful, uh, something real powerful you can get into before God and make things begin to happen. Praying in the spirit with vision. Okay? Now we've been, obviously we've been developing the thought that, you know, dreams and visions were uh, an integral part of man's communication with God. Right through the Bible, we find that dreams and visions were an integral part of the way God communicated with man. And God uses rima and vision to contact us. Okay, we understand, you understand what I mean by rima? God uses rima, the quickened word, either directly from the, the scriptures, taking a scripture or a portion of scripture or a verse, and uh, making it a living, personal word to you. We call that a rima. Or God directly speaking to your spirit. I mean, the rima doesn't just have to be scripture. But if God speaking to you direct, it will always, whatever God says to you, it will always be in harmony with the scripture. But he can speak to you, see? A, a prophecy can be a rima. It's not scripture, but it, it's in line with scripture. It's in harmony with the scripture. And so God speaks to us. God communicates with us. God uses rima and vision to make contact with us. Now we need to always remember that. Rima and vision. Our capacity to see and hear uh, on a spiritual level can be seen in these two uh, primary senses uh, of, being, of, of hearing and seeing. There's two, two primary senses of spiritual senses of seeing and hearing. God uses them to interact with us. Okay? And we really do need both. We, we need to develop both. God, you know, spoke to Abraham in Genesis 12, gave him a great promise that he would be a father of many nations. That was the rima. That was God speaking to him. And so the promise came and it was fantastic, it was wonderful. But a little uh, later in, in Genesis uh, 13, he took him outside and he said, now look at the stars uh, of the sky. And he said, then he gave him a, a vision. It was rima and vision that God used with Abraham in order that he might to bring to pass the purposes in his life. And uh, these two factors uh, are very, very important. In the life of, of Balaam, Balaam was a prophet um, whose ability to hear from God was highly respected. Now, kind of, he had some problems in his own personal life, you know, but as a, the capacity to hear um, from God, it was very, very highly respected. And we notice how he how he did this, how he developed this. In the book of Numbers, chapter 24, and verse 4, it, um, it, it specifies the two ways in which um, he related to God and he heard from God. And it says in, in Numbers 24, and verse 4, he had said, and it uses this, which heard the words of God and saw the visions of the Almighty. Okay, there we have it. Numbers chapter 24, speaking of Balaam, who was a prophet of the Lord. This verse says, And he hath said, which he heard the words of God. That's Rima, hearing the words of God. And he saw, saw something in the realm of the Spirit. He saw visions of the Almighty. Okay, so we've got the two things. We've got the Rima, hearing and seeing, the way that God interacts with man, do the rima of the word, hearing the word, hearing God speak, and seeing the visionary capacity which we have to develop. And so these two modes of communication are the way in which God primarily uh, interacts with the human race, you and I. We hear and we see. Okay? And so those spiritual senses have to de be developed. We have, of course, in the life of um, Jesus, we just have the same principle coming through in the life of Jesus. In John chapter 5, verse 19, he said, He did only what he saw, that's the visionary capacity, saw the Father doing. And then a little later in verse 30, it says, As I hear, I judge. Those two spiritual senses were very much awakened in Jesus. Hearing as he heard what God said to him, that he spoke. 
he judged. And he did only what he saw the father doing. So he comes to the pool of Bethsaida, and as he's walking, either maybe maybe could have been the day before, or, or that same day as he's heading in that direction, he saw the father go to that pool and raise up a man. And so it was just a simple fact. He'd already, with his visionary capacity, he'd seen it happen. And so when he came to the place, he knew what he had to do. He did what he saw the father had done, or what the father was doing. And that was the way he operated. With, and the words which I speak, he said, are not my words. As I hear, I judge. And so those two primary factors are senses, rima and vision. We have to develop those two areas and the spiritual senses because they're used to contact and relate to the Lord. Okay, now I want to teach you tonight a powerful way, going on from that, to a form of creative intercession, um, which we need to learn. Now there are many levels of intercession, creative intercession, there are levels of prophetic intercession which are quite profound. Um, but I want to talk tonight about this, this first level which you need to develop in your life um, and that's a form of creative intercession and uh, I want to link it to you tonight about praying in the spirit, praying in tongues with visionary capacity. This is a powerful um, form of intercession which you need to develop in your life. First we have to realize and value the importance of speaking in tongues. Okay, Now these things we should know and we should operate, but sometimes we have the capacity to hear and not do. Or to hear, give some understanding to and assent to it, but we never get around to making it a way of life. And things only become reality when you make them a way of life. And so I want to just talk to you about this tonight again because it, it is very, very important, and you, and you in sharing with others need to understand these things. It's the key, the value, uh, uh, importance of ministering to the Lord, prayer in tongues. You know, Pentecostals have been accused of putting too much emphasis on speaking in tongues. Well, I don't believe they put enough emphasis on speaking in tongues. It is one of the most important tools that you have in the realm of the Spirit. And uh, you need to be aware of that. Just uh, you just just read through First Corinthians chapter fourteen. You read through that chapter and see what it has to say about speaking in tongues. Paul says in that chapter, in verse fifteen, "I would that you all spoke in tongues." Um, a bit later, in verse four, he said, "He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself." A little later, in verse eighteen, it says, "I thank God," Paul said, "that I speak in tongues more than you all." His life was constantly immersed in a flow of spirit language, speaking in tongues. It was a way of life with Paul, praying in the spirit. He said, I do it more than any of you. I speak in tongues more than you all. And um, we talked about this last week, the importance of it. In Jude chapter, sorry, Jude verse 20, building yourselves up, praying in the Holy Ghost. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, is part of the armor, praying always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Praying always. Okay. I think you understand the difference between the gift of tongues and speaking in tongues. Yeah, I think you would understand that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it speaks of uh, one of the gifts, the nine gifts of the Spirit, is speaking in other tongues. Now, now, I'm not talking about that tonight. I'm not talking about the gift of tongues, okay, which is something which is, can, can be operated in the church as a gift, like prophecy or one of the other gifts, gifts of healing. I'm not talking about that tonight. Um, it, you all should be speaking in tongues. You all may not have the gift of tongues. Okay, and the primary gift of tongues on the day of Pentecost was to speak in a language um, which they had not learned so other people could hear the gospel. Okay, now that's going to happen again in the end times. There's no doubt about it. But um, there is, of course, the, the thought of tongues and interpretation in the church. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the devotional use of tongues. If you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you should be speaking in tongues. 
That doesn't mean to say you have a, the gift of tongues to minister in the church, but you have the ability to pray in the spirit, a devotional use of tongues. There is a difference between the two. And what I'm talking about tonight is your ability to pray in the spirit, to pray in tongues, to speak in tongues, okay? Um, and it's very, very important. In order to do this, I want to kind of link the allegory together between speaking in tongues and circumcision, because it's very important you understand this. Um, coming back to Abraham, Abraham was the father of our faith, we understand and we know that, and in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 14, we have that very familiar verse that, um, speaking about the death and resurrection of Jesus for this purpose, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon us, the Gentiles, through Jesus Christ, what, that we might receive this promise of the Spirit. Okay, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon you, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, that um, those who receive the promise of the Spirit. Now notice he links the blessings of Abraham with those that receive the Spirit. Okay, now this is very, very important. The blessings of Abraham in coming into your life are linked with those people who receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And it's specific, it's very, very clear that the blessings of Abraham may come upon the Gentiles, we which receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And so the two things are very clearly linked together. The blessings of Abraham, of course, were everything that Christ has purchased for us through Calvary. Financial blessing, material blessing, victory over our enemies, um, the relationship that Abraham had with God, the tremendous relationship, this is, can be ours, the fruitfulness, the, the possession of the promised land which God promised to him, uh, the fulfillment of the destiny of, on his life. All of these things uh, were the blessings which were upon Abraham. And, and Paul is saying now all these blessings be can become yours, you who become recipients of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. He's linking the two together. Okay, now let's just look at this. The Bible tells us, first of all, when God first touched Abraham, and uh, let's just find it for you, in Genesis chapter 15, he's dealing with Abraham, and it says, Abraham, God was dealing with him, and it says, Abraham believed God. Okay, faith, believing God, in Genesis uh, 15 and verse 6, and it says, he believed in the Lord, and that, because he believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. That was the basis, the foundation of the whole thing. How many of you know, because you believe God through faith, and you believe God, you're accounted righteous. It's through, salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ, not of works, lest any man should get into the act and be, feel proud about it. But he says, it's because we just believe God. Okay, through faith you are born again. This is what's happening. This was, this, this was the first stage with Abraham. Abraham believed God, and because of that, because his faith in that and faith alone, it was counted unto him for righteousness. That was the first stage in Abraham's life. Salvation through faith. Okay, that was the first stage. And that's the first stage in our lives. When we're born again by the Spirit of God, it's through salvation through faith in the shed blood of Jesus. But there was a second stage in Abraham's life. And the second stage was also um, very important. And the second stage comes a little later in Genesis chapter uh, let's see, 17 and verse 2. And it says, um, Abraham's 90 years old now. And uh, it says in verse 2, Now I will make a covenant between, between you and me, and I will multiply thy seed exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Now this is quite a while after his first encounter with the Lord, where he believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now sometime later, he's 90 years old, God comes to him, and he says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. It's very, very interesting because there are times in our lives when God makes covenants with us by the Spirit of God. 
But this time he came to Abraham and he said, Now, nothing more can happen until I make this covenant with you. And so there's another thing unfolding. It's a second stage. And he said, Now, I'm going to give you a sign or a seal or a token that I've made a covenant with you. You remember when um, Noah came out of the ark and God put a rainbow in the sky he said, no, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And this is the seal. He said, every time you see this in the sky, he said, I will never, you'll be rest assured, I will never, ever do this to the earth again. He was talking about the flood. So he, made an assur- he gave him a covenant, and he gave him a token or a sign or a seal of a rainbow that went with that covenant. So, now here God's making a covenant with Abraham. And it's, he's saying, now I'm making a covenant. You know when God makes a covenant, it's assured. Okay? When God makes a covenant, there's usually two parties to a covenant, but when the covenant is made, it is for sure. God will never ever break his covenant. He goes through the scriptures over and over again, and, says that, and it's repeated over and over again, that he would not break the covenant he made with Abraham and his seed. So now it's coming down to the point where God's laying his word on the line and he's making a covenant with him and he's, he's kind of sealing something in into Abraham's life and um, it's recorded here in, in, in this chapter chapter 17 he said I'm going to make a covenant with you verse 2 and he said this covenant will be made and thou shalt be a father of many nations and in verse 8 it says now I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee not just you Abraham but all of your seed after you, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting uh, possession, and I will be their God. And he said, okay, now this is the covenant, verse 10, which uh, you shall keep between me and you, and thy seed after thee, every man child among you shall be circumcised. Okay, the rite of circumcision, and he goes into that. Now, why did God do that? I mean, at the best of times, it's a strange thing to do. He said, now I'm going to make you a father of many nations, and today, Abraham, I'm making a covenant with you. I'm going to give you a sign that this covenant will... All, I will honor this covenant. You've got it from me. I'm making a covenant with you. And uh, he said, the covenant is going to be sealed in the rite of circumcision. Why did God do that? Simply, now listen to me, God put a mark on Abraham's body where life, biologically, would flow from. From which then his seed would be born, Isaac would be born, who would inherit the land and the promises of God would come to pass. Okay, let me put, say that again. God put a seal or a sign or a token in this making of this covenant He put a mark on Abraham where life, biological life, would flow from him, which from his seed, then he would become, would be born, who would inherit the land. And so the promise which God would give him would come to pass. Now, that mark was a promise of fertility and would ensure, without doubt, that the promise given to him would be fulfilled even though it would require a miracle, a child in their old age. And then that covenant continued on with um, his descendants. Very, very interesting. Now I want you to grasp this, because we're talking in the natural, first of all. God says, now you're going to have a a son. And your seed from from him, your seed is going to fill the whole earth. He said, let you see the stars, your seed is going to be the stars of heaven. Now Abraham's 90, and Abraham and Sarah's pushing it too. And, uh, you know, he said, Now, I know it's hard to believe, but I'm going to make a covenant with you. When I make this covenant, that is it, Abraham. It's sure. It's sealed. It's settled. It's over. It will happen. And he gave him this right, this right of circumcision, putting a mark on him where life biologically would flow from. And so God made this strange, this unusual covenant. Uh, and, and a sealing with Abraham and then all of his descendants. You say, well, what's the connection between this and speaking in tongues? Okay, first of all, saved by faith, like Abraham, who 
we come into the kingdom of God, we're born again by the Spirit of God, we are saved by faith. We're made righteous in the eyes of the Lord by faith. That's the first step you entered into, right? You've been born again by faith. That was the first step that Abraham entered into. Okay, but God wants more than that for your life. He wants you to bring forth life. He wants you to enter into your inheritance in God, your destiny for your life, what God has purposed for you, what God has got for you. There is a purpose, there is a destiny, there are the promises of God which were over you before you were born. They may have been spoken through your life as you've lived, but those promises, the purposes of God, God said of Jeremiah, before you were born, before I formed you, I knew you and I ordained you, ordained you to become a prophet to the nations. That was before he was even born. God has a purpose and a plan for your life, right? And like Abraham, God had a purpose and a plan. There were promises. There were things in the destiny of this man who came from an incredibly occultish background. He came out of Babylon. That's where he lived. And that's what he came out of. An incredibly heathen, occultish background. But God says, I'm going to get a hold of you, Abraham. I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to do some things in your life. And uh, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And uh, he, he began to do that. The first step was that, that salvation through faith. But God wants much more than that from us. He's, he's got more for us. God wants us to bring forth life. With Abraham, this required something else in Abraham's life. God was to make a covenant with him. Second stage of fruitfulness. God wanted to make a covenant with him, a sign, the token um, of circumcision. Now let's see at this point, this didn't give him greater standing with God. He already had good standing with God. When you're born again, you have right standing with God. How many of you know when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues and do everything else, you don't have any more greater standing with God than the person who is not baptized in the Holy Spirit? You see? You kind of have these funny doctrines, you're not accepted by God unless you're baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak, speak in other tongues. Well, yeah, it's an incredible doctrine to try and kind of find in the Word of God. Um, you're accepted, accepted by God and to God through faith. End of story. Okay? Because God made this covenant with him and sealed it with circumcision, it didn't mean that uh, he was more acceptable before God. He wasn't. There was no difference in his acceptance before God. That really didn't change anything. He was already accepted by faith. But what had happened, it did make possible for God to bring to pass his purposes for him. Okay? It made possible a flow of life biologically that brought to pass God's purposes for him. See, you can be accepted by God, born again by the Spirit of the Lord, but doesn't mean that you're automatically going to enter into all that God has purposed for you. It doesn't change your acceptance and standing with God remains the same, but your fruitfulness and whether you enter into your inheritance is another thing. That was another stage in, in Abraham's life, which God had to bring him to. And it made it possible a flow of life that brought to pass God's purposes. Now, so it is with us. Okay, we're born again. We come to the kingdom of God. Mark 16 and verse 17 says, Speaking in tongues is for a sign. And then we read um, in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, come across to 2 Corinthians and chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. It speaks, uh, now verse 21, first of all it says, Now we are established in Christ. Okay, we come into the kingdom of God. It says in verse 22, Now he which is established, who establisheth you in Christ and has anointed us is God. Then it says, Who hath sealed us? And given us the earnest of the Spirit in our heart. All right. Who has sealed us um, and given us the earnest? That word earnest is a Greek word which means a pledge or a token, a sign, 
Okay, God has sealed us with the Holy Spirit, that's a covenant he makes with us, and has given us a sign or a seal of the Spirit within our heart, a Greek, a pledge, a, a, a token of our inheritance. First salvation, then a seal or a token of the Holy Spirit, the earnest, just the down payment, a sealing. So he's talking about the, the Spirit coming into our lives. So the, the incoming of the Spirit, speaking in tongues, is a token or just a pledge for what God wants to bring us into. Now, let me just say this. As God put a mark on Abraham where life would flow from, where the promises of God would come to pass in his life, so God puts a mark in your mouth. He puts a sign a token or a mark in your mouth where life is going to flow from which will make possible the purposes of God to come to pass in your life. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you see the allegory between the two? As with Abraham, God put a mark on him, made it possible. Fertility and the promises of God being fulfilled. We come across into the new covenant. God puts a mark in your mouth. Okay? And that mark, we come to it in a moment, is speaking in tongues. He's put a mark where life spiritually will flow from and will bring to pass God's purposes and inheritance in your life. Now we need to grasp that because you will really never see the tremendous importance and significance of speaking in tongues until you grasp this. God's put a sign where life is going to flow from in the area of your mouth. And it's going to make possible for us to inherit our land and our promises. Now when we come to Philippians chapter 3 in verse 3, come across to Philippians, Paul kind of hooks it together here in Philippians Chapter 3, and verse 3, he's bringing it across into a New Testament, the New Covenant understanding. It says now in the New Testament, we're not in the Old now, not under law, it says we are the circumcision, we are the equivalent to the Old Testament circumcision, who? Which worship God in the Spirit. Okay, he's spiritualizing it, says, we are the equivalent now, we have the same sign that they had in the Old Testament, but we in the New Testament have it somewhere else. We have it in our mouth. Those who worship God in the Spirit, with other tongues, with the ability of the Holy Spirit, with the anointing. These are the New Testament people who are equivalent to those who have been circumcised in the Old. He said, we've got a mark in our mouth. And we worship God in the Spirit. Okay. Speaking in tongues brings a flow of life which makes possible for God to bring us into our inheritance in God. Without that in Abraham's life, the promises would never have been fulfilled. But once God puts that sign in your mouth, he's saying, Hey, now I've done my part. If you do yours, it'll happen. As simple as that. I've made a covenant with you now. It's the seal, it's the down payment that you will now get everything. The earnest is the seal, just the down payment that you will get everything that God has got for you if you let the life flow. It's as simple as that. You see, when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're only beginning a walk with God, you're only babes in Christ, we're beginning a walk with God which is supposed to lead us into the fullness of the purposes of God in our lives. It's only the down payment of what God has got for you. It's the earnest, the down payment of what God has. Come across with me uh, to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse, um, <clears throat> verse 14. Oh, really in verse 13, pick it up. It says, in verse 13 of Ephesians 1, In whom you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Okay, that's the first stage. 
That's Abraham's first stage. You believed God that was accounted, in whom you trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, in whom after, the second stage, after that you believed, something else happened in your life, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Okay? Two stages. He said, now, you believed, that was the gospel coming into your life, born again by the Spirit of God. He said, and after that, there was something else happened. God made a covenant with you. That covenant was sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Promise of what? Verse 14, which is the earnest, the token, the sign, the pledge, just like circumcision was a sign or a token, which is the earnest, the down payment, the sign that you're going to enter into your full inheritance, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Okay, that's very, very interesting uh, verse of Scripture. He said, first of all, you've received the gospel, but he said something else happened. He said, my spirit came into your life. And he said, I sealed you. From that point on, it was possible for all of God's purposes that he planned from the ages past that all of God's purposes could be fulfilled in your life. He said, now if you do your part now, he said, he's put a mark, it's a seal in your mouth. He's given you the earnest of the Holy Spirit and sealed you, sealed the mark in your mouth. And he said, that is the down payment, that is the earnest, that is the sign now that it will come to pass. If you let the life flow from the area of your mouth. And as the life flows, something's going to happen in the realm of the Spirit. It was a guarantee. Abraham and circumcision was a guarantee of the token of the fulfilling of the promise. Now he says, you after you received the gospel, you were sealed, which is the earnest, the down payment, the guarantee, the token, the pledge of your inheritance. And so the purposes of God in your life have to come and be released, just like Abraham, there was a flow of life from his body which brought to pass the purposes of God. There is a flow of life from your mouth which has to come in the realm of the spirit that will begin to bring to pass God's purposes for your life. As you speak in tongues in the realm of the spirit and reach into God in intercession in tongues, it has a life birthing power. Okay? A life birthing power. Things actually begin to happen. And you know when you pray in tongues, you pray in the will of God, the Bible says. And the Bible says also that if you pray anything in the will of God, He hears us, and if He hears us, we have our petition. Every time you pray in the Spirit, it's answered. I want you to think about that. Every time you pray in the Spirit, it's answered. Guaranteed to be answered. That is it. God's put the, given you that guarantee. He's given you that token. He's given you that sign. He's made that covenant with you. He said it's guaranteed. There's a tremendous power, life-birthing power of praying in the realm of the Spirit. God does something in your life when that gets underway. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8 and verse... Verse 26, Romans 20, verse, sorry, Romans chapter 8, verse 26, says, Likewise, the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, also helpeth our weaknesses, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. With groanings which cannot be uttered, that and he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for us according to the will of God. And then we are going to know something that all things will work together for God, for good, to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purposes. For whom he foreknew your life, he knows what he, you were born for. 
He also did predestinate that you might be conformed to the image of his Son and be the firstborn among many brethren. All right. It says the Holy Spirit now will pray through us, will make intercession through us because we do not know how to pray fully for our lives, for our future, and what God has got for us. But it says, He that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit for us. And he will make intercession for us according to the will of God. Hallelujah. And he said, then when that happens, something else is going to happen. All things are going to work together for good. All things do not work together for good until you start to begin to pray in the Spirit. They can't, because you're not praying according to the will of God. There are many things about our lives and futures and purposes of God that we don't know. That He makes intercession according to the will of God for us. There's a life birthing factor, our inheritance, all that God has purposed from us from the foundation past. He'll begin to pray them into existence for us. And that's what the Bible goes on to say here. It says, we know then that all things are going to work together for good to them that are called according to his purposes. What is his purpose for us? Because he foreknew our lives, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Now let me just talk to you a minute about predestination. Predestination, biblical concept of predestination is not that God has decided that you have a certain... Uh, destiny and you can't get away from it that's not what he's talking in other words it's predestined so it's going to happen anyway because God has predestined it doesn't say that at all the Bible says here two things it says um, for whom he did foreknow he predestinated foreknowledge always goes before predestination you say how many of you know that the moment and before, but we'll, we'll deal with the moment you came into this life because it's more realistic to you. The moment you were born, God foreknew your life. Because he lives in eternity. Past, present and future. That's how the Apostle Paul, the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos could go 2,000 years into the future and talk with people who had not yet been born. How did you work that out? He saw people praising the Lord who had never yet been born. Martyrs were under the throne. They hadn't yet been born yet, but he saw them. Okay, because we're dealing with God. Past, present and future. That's important when it comes to intercession too. Well, I won't get into that tonight. Um, God, you can bring things to pass. You can even change things. But... You know, they, they, they say, you know, all these programs on television, if you go, go back in time, if you travel faster than light, you start to go back in time, and, uh, you know, and you can change things, and then it affects the future. Okay? I mean, you're getting some real kind of scenarios into that kind of thing, you know? You go back in time, and you meet... Say you, you go back, say, 50 years in time, and you meet the person who is to become your mother, and you marry her, that kind of changes the future, doesn't it? You see what I'm talking about? <laughs> um, how do we get into this? <laughs> anyway, predestination, that's right, predestination. See, God looks down your life. He knows whether you're going to accept the Lord as your Savior. Hey, everyone has the same opportunity in the sense that God doesn't say, this is it, I'm going to lay your life out now, and this is what will happen. No, he looks down your life and he sees the choices you're going to make. He sees what you will do with your life. And he looks to the end of your life and he knows what you will do. By your own free will of choice, he knows what you're going to do. Whom he foreknew, those people that were predestined, he knows what your destiny is because he can see to the end of your life. Now he doesn't force you to make those decisions. He doesn't do anything like that. You have choice. But he knows, he sees the choices you will make as he works down through your life. He sees you growing older before you grow old. He knows the choices you will make. He gets to the end of the, your life. He can evaluate your life by the choices you have made, the responses you have made to God. He says, yes, this person, this is how he'll end up. They are predestinated to that because that's the way they will go. Predestination according to the foreknowledge of God. Now, 
there are certain things that God has got for us, there's no doubt about that, but they will not automatically come to pass. They have to be birthed in the realm of the Spirit through right choices, right responses to the Lord, and through the kind of thing that we are talking about today. It says, because we don't always know what God has got for us and the purposes of God for our life, he says the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, will make intercession for us according to God's will. The Holy Spirit will begin to pray through us for our lives according to God's will. And then we will know that all things will begin to work together for good. To them who love God, to them who are called, to have a call according to his purposes. He says, because whom he foreknew, he predestinated. Okay? And so Paul is talking about that. The ability of the Holy Spirit, knowing the mind of the Spirit, to pray through us in intercession. That's why we say that whenever you pray in tongues, it is answered. You always have the answer for what you're praying for. Yeah, that's incredible when you think about that. If you really just think about that one thing alone, you'll spend more time praying in tongues. Because it's always answered, because it's always in the will of God. And then all things begin to happen in your life. The right things slot into place, all things begin to work together for good, because the Holy Spirit is praying ahead of you and arranging it according to the will of God, and it will happen because it's prayed in the Holy Spirit. And it all begins to work together. But people who don't spend time, they don't spend time praying in the Spirit, don't spend time birthing. God's put a mark in your, in your mouth where He can bring to pass His purposes for your life, but unless we do it, it's not effective. And that's the same as see with Abraham, the promises of God in his life. God put a token with him, a seal of circumcision. He says, it'll happen. Do your part, and it'll happen. And he says, with you today, he said, there's a seal, the earnest of your inheritance. It's giving you the down payment of the Spirit, a token in your mouth. Now he said, the full inheritance is ahead of you, but it's got to be birthed in the realm of the Spirit. Okay, understanding that and the, the tremendous importance of that, God gave Abraham one other thing. We gave him, we mentioned earlier, he gave him not just the Rima, but he gave him a visual reference, right? It was Rima and vision that God dealt with him in. Same with Jesus, Rima, hearing and vision. Okay, now there's an area which you need to learn to couple with this. That's very exciting. If you'll do it and get into it, into the flow of the Spirit in that, that is praying in the Spirit with vision. Praying in the Spirit, which is a life birthing factor, with vision. Now, remember last week we talked about uh, the importance of and getting into that realm of the Spirit in the visionary capacity. Um, how in 2 Corinthians 3.18 and we beholding him in a glass or in the Greek the mirror or the screen. Okay? And it says we see through this glass darkly. It's not always vividly clear. But we can behold the Lord. Beholding him. And we talked about, remember the screen where you can put up on the screen anything you want out of your imagination. Satan can project onto that screen and God can project onto the screen, right? So you have to keep your screen clean. Just keep good things up on that screen. Otherwise you're going to be in big trouble. You control. Okay, but it says there's a screen in there. The Bible calls it uh, we, as a glass. Beholding him as in a glass. The glory of the Lord. We are changed from one level of glory to another. It's a Greek word for screen or a mirror. And uh, we put the Lord onto that screen beholding him in our mind's eye and you kind of we talked about priming the pump remember it's you that's doing that initially you put the you set your the eyes of your heart upon the Lord on that screen beholding him and what you focus on you tune into that's a spiritual law 
So when you do that, you begin to tune into the Lord. And it passes from you, your projection, then it, it, it transcends into another level of his projection onto the screen. Now, understanding that, when we come to the Lord, we behold him, we, we put him up there, we set the Lord before our eyes. We behold him, we minister to him, uh, our focus is held on there, and we get into the realm of the Spirit, and we begin to pray in tongues. This is intercession. This is praying in tongues. And you'll find, as you get into a flow of that, and stay with it, you don't hurry it, you get into a flow, you'll find with your focus upon the Lord, you'll find slowly that God, the Spirit, will begin to put other things up on that screen. And there'll be quite often... First of all, things for your own life. You'll begin to see what God's purpose and destiny for you is up on that screen. And as you're praying in tongues, you are praying in the will of God and you are birthing in the realm of spirit your inheritance, your destiny in God. And it's an exciting way to get into because then God begins to show you something of your inheritance. And it can be in a series of pictures, it can be in a series of events, and you're praying in other tongues, you're not praying in English, you're praying in other tongues, you're praying in the Spirit. You're seeing the Holy Spirit is projecting your future because he knows the future. He's projecting what his purposes for you are up onto that screen and the coupling of the two in praying in the Spirit with a visionary capacity is incredibly powerful in the realm of birthing into the realm of the Spirit. You couple the two together then. You couple the word of the Lord, the Rima, which is now praying in the Spirit, and from that point of view, with a visionary capacity, and you are birthing in the realm of the Spirit. I've many, many times, I, I, I've, I've been into the, in the realm of the Spirit, just waiting on the Lord, beholding Him, praying in tongues, and suddenly I'm in another nation. Seeing things happen. And as I pray in the Spirit, I either stop them happening or I birth them. It can be either way. God sometimes wants to stop things happening. You see, we need to be praying for China at this present time. China is at the crossroads. What's happening there is unprecedented in the history of China. China is at the crossroads of civil war. We don't know the purposes of God and the, ramif the long-term ramifications of the next few years. What's at stake there? But I want to tell you, there's a lot of powers of darkness and powers of good are in conflict over China. Okay? There's a lot at stake. And see, it's, it's important that Christians around the world may begin to pick up that burden in the realm of the Spirit and begin to intercede in the realm of the Spirit and begin to change, or release, or birth some of those things there in the realm of the Spirit. See, it's not just always just for your own life. There's a whole, now this is a very elementary level of, of, of this, is the realm of prayer and intercession. There's a much, much deeper level, but you've got to start on this whole thing. And, and, and get in, God can show you things uh, of the future circumstances which can be changed stopped in the will of God or birthed in the will of God so that with your visionary capacity you end up beginning to kind of walk into the future we kind of walk through a prophetic anointing into the purposes of God and things at that level begin to change whom we predestined, whom we call all things then begin to slot in, begin to work together for good according to the will of God for your life. See, it's a prophetic, it's a flow of the Spirit, it's a, it's a prophetic form of praying. Your inheritance in God, you see, is linked with your mouth. And God has put a sign, a mark, a token in your mouth which is going to make you fruitful. Just like he did with Abraham. 
He's put a mark and he's made a covenant with you concerning your inheritance in God. He said, that's just a down payment of your inheritance. Now it's got to unfold. But if you let the life birthing power come out of your mouth, I'll bring it, it can be birthed into your life. You see, you are sowing in the spirit. You are building in the invisible for your life. See, a lot of people go down their lives and people say to me, you know, I don't know why that person got all the breaks, why these, that, why, you know, God worked for them, why things happen in their life. Well, I'll tell you why, because they've, they've built in the spirit, they've built in the invisible, that's why. You say, well, it doesn't happen to me, maybe you haven't built in the invisible. The building in the invisible is a form of prayer and intercession. And you've got to build it. You've got to bring it to pass. You've got to, you've got to get into the realm of the Spirit and birth those things in God. And some people go all of their lives and things don't happen for them because they have never built. And sometimes people go for a long time and they sowed in the Spirit and they built in the Spirit and suddenly the timing comes and, and God works and everything unfolds for them. And they get birthed into something in God. Sometimes it's going to be after many years of sowing to the Spirit. Building in the Spirit. And that cracks in God and you're into it. And people look and say, oh, why did that happen to them? I mean, you know, how come? Well, it's because they built in the Spirit. Building in the invisible. Sowing to the Spirit. Making intercession in the will of God. So that the promises of God. See, Abraham is made righteous by faith, but the purposes of God could not come to pass in his life until something else happened. And that one thing was that God had to make another covenant with him and seal it. He said, now Abraham, it'll happen. You've been born again, fine, that gives you standing with God, right standing, but we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit in the capacity to pray in the Spirit, that mark in your mouth is a second stage. And he said, then if you will use it, I birth. Your inheritance will not be just a down payment, not just a pledge, not just the earnest. It will come into fullness. This is the down payment. He said, now go for it. Birth it in the Spirit with the power in your mouth. Learning to walk in birthing and praying in the Spirit with a visionary capacity. I want you to begin to enter into this. I want you to begin to do this. I want you to begin to get into that dimension. Now, if in the visionary capacity, if at any stage it becomes negative and destructive, or destructive, wipe the screen and put the Lord back up there. You cannot guarantee, because your minds are still very wayward, they're not renewed yet, you can't always guarantee that your mind is not going to start painting something up there with God. Or sometimes other spirits come in. Okay? So if it becomes negative, or if it becomes destructive in the visionary capacity of what you're seeing, wipe the screen, keep praying in the spirit, put the Lord back up there. Okay? Start again, let him t- take you. And that's how you learn. To flow in the realm of the spirit, and it's very, very important that you you begin to do it, that you understand the principle, and that you begin to do it. There's lots of things happening in the world today, and nations of the world. Things are happening right now around the world, and it's very, very important that God has sensitive people who will pick up the burden of the Spirit, sometimes for these other nations. Because prayer, things are birthed out of prayer, in visionary capacity, and the prophetic flow of the Holy Spirit. Things are happening in Russia, which are very important. Things are happening in China. Okay? Things are happening in Iran. The momentous events, you know, with the death of the Ayatollah, you know, if Iran, if Iran decrees a holy war against Israel, they have big problems. Israel could never survive it, except by God. We need to pray 
Because the enemy is moving on every front, but so is God. And all things can work together for good, but there's got to be birthings in the realm of the spirit. And there's certain events that are taking place around the world which have long-term ramifications for us and the kingdom of God. We need to be aware that things are moving, things are happening. Things which have never happened for years and years and years, within a matter of six months have happened all around the world. Remember last year we were saying that this year there will be global changes? Well, it's happening all around the world, global changes. Now, you've got to be sensitive to the realm of the Spirit and prayer. It is the greatest adventure in the Christian life. More than anything else, it's the most important ministry above all other ministries. Is the ministry of intercession. And for your own life, and for the church and for the nations of the world, nothing happens without it. That's where things are made to happen. That's where things are birthed in that realm. We see God pouring out His Spirit and we see things happening. That's just the overflow of what's happened back here, which has been birthed in the Spirit. We just see the results of it. Nothing happens where back here somewhere, somehow, some person or a group of people birthed something in God, released something in God, and it happened. And I want you to kind of learn to understand the tremendous importance and the tremendous value of praying in the Spirit. Paul was very clear. He said, you're not going to come into your inheritance without it. That's how it's birthed. And so the importance, you see, you know, praying in tongues, baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues is not an optional extra. It's absolutely vital if you're going to fulfill God's purposes for your life. You can't without it. That's why we don't make enough of speaking in tongues. People say we overemphasize it. We don't emphasize it enough. It is the most important thing in your life. Birthing in the realm of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Let's just pray for a few moments, shall we? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Prayer is not a dull thing, it's a very exciting thing. You know how to do it properly. And we need to learn, we have got to put, as I said last week, quality time aside for this ministry. It's not just an optional extra. It's the lifeline of your Christian life. All things will not work together for good unless you do it. They don't just happen automatically because you're a Christian and you love God. got to do it. God needs to raise up people who can move in power and intercession, prayer, reaching into God. I'm going to tell you, but the purposes of God for this church, which are, I believe are vast and quite big in this city, will never happen unless they are birthed in intercession. They will not. I want to tell you, this church is under siege from the occult. And unless some people really get down to real intercession, we're going to be battling uphill. We are under siege. They know, to a degree, to a level, the purposes of God for this church. And we've got to have people who know how to come before God and get in the Spirit and bring down through intercession. The opposition, the enemy is arrayed against this church. I tell you, I nearly didn't make it tonight. The opposition was so great. 
I decided around about half past five that I would, I would be able to come. We've got to pray. We've got to have people who know how to pray, who know how to flow in tongues and in the spirit and in vision, prophetic flow of the Holy Ghost to birth the purposes of God for this church and for your life. Father, I pray tonight that you'll just take this word as seed and as it's been scattered into the hearts of people tonight that it might find ground to grow in, germinate and produce fruit. That it might take root within the hearts and lives of people here tonight and change their prayer lives, change their approach to the things of God with understanding coming before the throne of God in intercession and in prayer. Father, I just pray tonight that by your Spirit you'll birth something out of these words which have been spoken tonight within the hearts of your people which will affect changes within them and bring them into a new degree, a new dimension of prayer, intercession, and praying in the Spirit to bring to pass your purposes in their lives and for this church and for our nation. Lord, I pray, teach your people how to pray. For in doing so, things are changed. And all things begin to work together for good. And the purposes of God for your life and for our church begin to unfold. Father, in Jesus' name, pray that you'll bring it home by your spirit and begin to cause your people to do it. See the value of it. See the, the importance of it and treat it as a priority, the most important ministry that anyone can ever have. It's the ministry of intercession and praying in the Spirit. Hallelujah. That the will of God might be accomplished according to His purposes. Hallelujah.